I am so glad to be here this morning, although I have to say, a month ago when we were talking about this keynote, the things that I thought we would be talking about were all the sphere and F1. And instead, I know that cybersecurity is on the minds of many people. Uh, of course, MGM and Caesars at the heart of that cyber intrusion. Um, and a lot of speculation now about whether paying a ransom was the right thing to do, whether there are ways to protect the business from the kind of intrusion that we saw. How do you solve for the human element in all of this? Then, of course, the culinary union has authorized a strike. And so the specter of a job walk-off weighs pretty heavily on the minds of some of the operators here in Las Vegas. And finally, uh, the world is in turmoil now. And there are questions about whether we're going to see what's happening in the Middle East tilt us more toward recession already when so many Americans are feeling a cost of living crisis. So there's a lot of issues to grapple with. I hope you'll find these conversations illuminating and enlightening and informative and maybe even entertaining. My first guest is Bill Karstangen, the CEO of Churchill Downs, joining me on stage this morning. Please give him a warm welcome. So, Bill, this is a big lead-up year to the Kentucky Derby, 150 years of this most iconic horse race in the United States. Give me a sense of how the planning's going and, and what you make of the anniversary. Well, it's, America's not really uh, an old country compared to some of the countries in the world, so 150 years in the United States is a really big deal, longest continually held sporting event. So we're trying to do something, a number of things really special. We're really rebuilding the whole facility, a uh, $200 million renovation uh, uh, project that will be done just in time for the Derby. So it'll touch everybody that comes to the Derby. And that's just the beginning. So we're putting everything we've got into this. Um, we joke some of our team will be around for the 200th, but uh, probably not me, given, uh, given the, the demographics. But uh, uh, we're all in. Um, we've got a great team. Hundreds of years of institutional experience across our team. So uh, if you don't have your tickets yet, you need to get out there and get them because I've never seen demand. During my 18 years in the, co in the company, I've never seen anything close to the, the demand we're seeing now. Uh, when you look at the fact that there has been betting on horses for so long, does the long experience with the Kentucky Derby and the culture of betting on the races inform the way you see the landscape now, the gambling landscape? Is it different, do you think, than other operators coming into the picture? Well, you know, from our perspective, um, the, the history of horse racing, it, it was the only legal form of gambling in the United States for most of the history of the country. So as you moved into the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and first you saw lotteries, then brick and mortar gaming, um, now online gaming. Those are all things that have impacted horse racing over time. But I think because the, the, the folks that founded our, our country came with horses and were immediately racing them, there were always exceptions for horse racing. So our sport's one that uh, has had to be resilient, had to change with the times, have take what we've learned from horse racing and from our experiences and apply them to new things available. That, that's part of the history and the evolution of our company. I mean, not only is the event, uh, the Kentucky Derby, 150 years old, but our company is 150 years old. And while we've grown really, really rapidly over the last 15 years, there's just a lot of institutional knowledge of, of how gaming has impacted uh, our company over time as new forms have become legal. Can and that's, that's what we're in now. We're in another evolution, another uh, uh, step change in, in gaming in the country. And you had embraced sports betting more broadly with Twin Spires. Can you talk to me a little bit about the factors that went into pulling away from broad-based sports betting and, and refocusing on racing, horse racing? Yeah, so um, online wagering on horse racing has been uh, legal 
uh, for a long, long time. And it, it really comes out of uh, laws in the 1970s that allowed people to wager on races across state lines. And, and so as the internet came along, uh, the opportunity was created for horse racing to be legal online. And so we had a monopoly for a long time. And part of the, the, the trajectory and the, and the journey of my career has been online wagering. I was part of the team that started our business, Twin Spires. So as we saw uh, PASPA get repealed and, and all of these changes starting to develop for other sports, um, we knew that would mean change. It was exciting, but it knew, we knew it would mean change. At first, we thought that everything we learned about horse racing online would directly translate into other sports. Uh, for those of you that, that know a bit about our company, you know, our Twin Spires business is a, a really powerful, great business with really high margins, and it's an online, highly profitable business. So we thought some of those lessons that we had learned building that business from the ground up would translate directly into sports wagering, but they really haven't. That's been a, an entirely different uh, model. And like what? I, I think uh, the marketing that's gone into it, the technology, the fact that uh, uh, you need partners in every state to gain access to every state. There are a lot more mouths to feed. So when we looked at what had looked, worked for us from a marketing perspective, and still works for us with Twin Spires, it's still a very profitable business. And in many ways, that division is, is, is still a shining star for us. Um, but as we saw online sports develop, we thought it could go a, a couple of different ways, and it's largely gone the way that, that we thought once we got into it. Uh, an increasingly small number of very, very large players investing lots of capital, willing to take uh, years of, uh, of, of uh, uh, lack of profitability in order to establish themselves. Um, that was all a way we thought it could go, and it was a way it could go. And I wish those companies well. That just wasn't going to be the right journey for our company. We're very margin driven, whether you look at our online business, our brick and mortar casino based business. Or, or the Derby itself. We're a very, very uh, margin-focused, profitability-focused business. So the long haul you needed to sign up for for online sports just didn't feel right for us once we got into it. But also, we were always conflicted because we also are a big content provider. We provide horse racing for other people's platforms for them to wager on our content. So we always had this this balance between do we want to be a B2C sports wagering business or do we want to provide content to the, the sports wagering platforms? That was always a, a, a pull and push in our organization. Has that shift been successful so far, the, the B2B? Oh, yeah. It, it's still in its nascent stages, but we've been really excited about it. Our, our partnerships with uh, FanDuel and DraftKings and uh, people forget what a great game for wagering horse racing is. It's a game where you understand your margins because the players are always betting against themselves, and as the house, you take a rake. But it's different than sports wagering where the house is ultimately always behind every bet. So the game of sports wage, of uh, horse racing, it's a great game if, uh, if you're the house. There's a lot of speculation about newcomers uh, fanatics coming into the game and, and making a play after DraftKings and FanDuel and Caesars and BetMGM have been there and have been, you know, working so hard and whether, whether the newcomers can make some hay out of that. And then, of course, ESPN and the tie-up with Penn is getting a lot of attention. I'm just curious whether whether any of these players came to you and said, all right, you're not going to operate Twin Spires like a sports betting platform, we'd like to buy it from you. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Twin Spires is uh, a bit of a unicorn. You know, it, it's an online business that's very, very profitable and continues to grow. So there's always been lots of interest in Twin Spires. It is not for sale. It is a big part of who we are. We have big plans for it in the future. Uh, never been more optimistic. But, but it, it does have an unusual profile now compared to where we are in online sports in general in that, in that it's, it's a very profitable uh, business, a very, uh, a very established, high-margin business. And so that always gets a lot of people's interest, and, and uh, that'll probably still be the case. But uh, it fits well with, with everything we do in our company, and uh, it's, it's just been the little engine that could for a long, long time, so we're going to keep at it. 
given what you've learned, do you think that these newcomers, do you think a small operator with, you know, 1% of market share has a shot at really making a successful business happen over the next, say, five years? Uh, sure. I, I think um, one advantage for us with Twin Spires is we started it you know, from a twinkle in our eye. So we built every single process there. So really understood margins, where, where there were margin slippages, how to build it, how to make it profitable. I think there's a lot of learning going on in the online space in general for sports wagering mm -hmm. or broader, the larger platforms. So I, I think there's a theory that size will uh, create profitability, and that's a good theory. But there's always space for people that build their processes very carefully and look every place where there's slippage, whether it be your technology package or, or your partnership relationships. Every single place you see in a value chain or, or, in, a, or in a cost structure where you can strip out costs, they'll be the player that looks at that chain very, very carefully and finds ways to, to maximize margin throughout it. Bill, we were sitting backstage together when um, Bill Miller gave the report and that number, that half a trillion dollar Americans gambling illegally every year, we all kind of stopped and looked at the screen. It's an attention getting number. I know that you're focused not on that big number, but on something much more on the ground, so to speak, this gray market in the skills-based machines. Can you talk to me a little bit about your concern and how it interferes with the profits of your business? Sure. Um, so, so far we've talked a lot about online and, and a bit about the Kentucky Derby, but we have about 30 gaming, brick and mortar gaming facilities across the United States. And uh, we're very, very active in, in uh, uh, brick and mortar gaming. Uh, you take three states that I, th I think Bill mentioned, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Kentucky, those are big, important states for our company, particularly uh, Kentucky and Virginia. So we've had a ringside seat to these uh, gray games, they call them, but it's just illegal gambling. Uh, most of the time, the law doesn't draw a distinction between skill-based gaming and, and uh, illegal gaming. It's, there's, there's just a definition of gambling that drives legality. So we've had a front row seat to some of the problems with uh, skill or uh, gray games. And, and essentially, they're just unlicensed, unregulated, untaxed, un misunderstood, not understood uh, uh, gaming devices that just proliferate across a jurisdiction. And absolutely, they have a very large impact on your licensed gaming, which usually is, uh, 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 involves a big capital investment that the state has asked you to make in order to get the franchise that you've been awarded, and all of the other requirements that go into just responsible, structured, safe gaming for patrons. You know, it's interesting because the AGA brought it to my attention. Um, I had interviewed the CEO of Aristocrat Gaming about the problem and, and what possible solutions were, but I had never seen it myself. And then I took a road trip to Branson, Missouri, because my mom decided that that's where she wanted her 70th birthday. So here I am driving through the states, and it felt like all of a sudden, every truck stop, every quick check, every, every, every small venue that you went to, the, the local arcade where my kids were playing video games had these machines in there that I had never seen before. Why did they proliferate in some states and not in others? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, some states, they've just managed to grab uh, a foothold. O other states have not been as tolerant on what is clearly unlicensed uh, illegal gaming. But some states, it's just grabbed a foothold. And I would say that the, uh, the gray game operators have uh, used the legal system and uh, the, the legislative system fairly effectively. So they try to create ambiguity, they try to create noise, and in the meantime, they can point to other, vendor, other uh, locations and say, look, they're not being stopped here. So they, they, they try a handful of different tactics in their states where it doesn't work, and their states where they've been able to get a foothold and uh, noise, 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 I would say, generally is behind their different tactics. Make it uh, confusing, make it a ambiguous, and just try to get a foothold, and then argue that people are going to be hurt when you pull the machines away. Uh, ultimately, I don't think it'll be successful long term, but 
you know, we always think that we're at the, uh, at the end of history, but we're all just in the middle of, of experiences. And so this is an experience where there's a big fight across a lot of these jurisdictions to, to eliminate gray games. And we're just in the middle of that fight. Uh, we're having success in Kentucky, got the law changed. In Virginia, the law is clear as a bell. It's just the noise of the legal system and, and, and the appeals and the injunctions working their way through the state court system that's, that's caused the, the friction and inefficiency now where there's still these games in operation. Bill, I talked to some cybersecurity professionals in the wake of the intrusions at MGM and Caesars. And what I was told is that these guys operate on a herd mentality. Once they figure out that it's successful for M to get into MGM and Caesars, not only do they keep trying those companies, but everybody else in the cyber criminal landscape tries too. And then they go for other companies within the same industry because they anticipate that the tech is built the same, that the portals to get in would be the same. Have you seen an increase in attempts for cyber intrusion? And how has what happened to MGM and Caesars changed your view of the threat of cybersecurity? In the case of our company, um, well, first, I'll back up and say the threat has never been greater than now. And I, I think there is something to the herd mentality and to, and to a focus across an industry. So I think all of us in the space are following uh, heightened processes, heightened training processes, more intense focus on everything that goes under the broad category of cybersecurity. I think we're all very, very focused and very concerned about it because clearly it's happening across our industry mm -hmm. now. And clearly there's something to this idea of a herd mentality. Uh, from our perspective, particularly starting around our online business, uh, we saw attacks a number of years ago, um, and that, that got folded into our, our DNA of, of being very concerned and focused on it. But when we saw uh, some of the other things we've seen publicly in the industry, uh, absolutely, we went and revisited everything, and particularly these uh, increasingly effective social engineering attacks where they're, they're able to worm their way through a human into the system. Uh, those have gotten even more sophisticated than they've been. And I think it's a challenge for everybody in the industry. It's a challenge for us. Yes, I think every day all of us are seeing attempts and uh, uh, their mitigation approaches, their processes that you can follow that help. But this is, a, this is going to be a long-term game where, uh, where uh, bad actors are going to try to infiltrate uh, uh, companies in circumstances where they think they can drive a monetary return from doing so. So all companies will have to think through their willingness to participate in, in, uh, in paying ransoms and, and otherwise how they interact with those different groups if those groups are successful in, in penetrating. Finally, I want to just ask you a little bit of your assessment for the health of the American consumer. Where do you see where we are in the cycle, how has it affected the behavior of your customers? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I don't feel old, I've, but you know, I've been in the company for 18 years and I've been in the number two role or the number ro one role for uh, 15 of those years, so I've seen cycles. I think coming out of COVID, there was a really intense sugar high. There was a lot of money sloshing around. There were a lot of programs. There was uh, COVID relief money, et cetera. So I think there was a real sugar high. I think. Things are settling, they have settled down. You can see that just generally across uh, industry numbers. However, this is a strong, robust American consumer. It's still a strong economy. So um, uh, having been around as long as I have in a, in a, in a top role, I've seen times that uh, were much more concerning than now. We just have to keep our eyes on things. I think uh, making sure that the economy doesn't overcorrect, you know, the, too much increases in interest rates or too much stimulus, it's always one thing or the other. There's always consequences down the road for those things. Uh, but, but generally, yeah, things are not quite what they were a year or so ago. Uh, there does seem some settling down. But uh, taking a broader perspective, which I have from doing this for a long time, still pretty darn solid, pretty good, pretty good. I mean, on that note, I like to end things on an up note. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us a little bit of an idea. I'm going to go get my hat made for the Kentucky Derby next year. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I think you can go out this left or right. Good luck with the left. Thank you. Appreciate it. My next guest is one of the most incredible women in gaming and one of the most powerful women in gaming, Yetta Nygaard Anderson, the CEO of Intain and uh, the joint venture, of course, in BetMGM. So I'd like to welcome with me now on stage, Yetta. This is a really exciting time for sports betting, of course, to, uh... oh, Yetta. There we go. Thank you. Yet it's an exciting time to talk about sports betting um, because of football being back in season. And um, there's a lot of excitement over, I mean, the Packers fans were taking over the, the hotel and they lost. It was sad. There was people <laughs> crying out there. Give me a sense of what you're excited about for sports betting landscape right now and how you see BetMGM contributing to Entain's big picture. Yeah, I'm excited to see so many people here this morning after the game last night. Um, it's super exciting for us. Uh, it's a new NFL season. That's always exciting. Uh, and uh, BetMGM is, is gearing up for that. We recently acquired a company called Angstrom, which uh, provides us with data analytics and pricing and forecasting uh, and some of the most uh, advanced in-play markets. So we're super excited to roll out these new products to BetMGM throughout the season. Um, it's exciting times. How challenging is it to integrate the Angstrom tech into a platform like BetMGM? So we're already in the process of doing that. I expect that we'll be fully integrated by the end of the year, but that doesn't mean that we can't start providing BetMGM with new products. We're already doing that. We've been working together for a while. So we have more markets now on the BetMGM app, uh, but in terms of getting a super advanced, fantastic single game parlay product up, we should see that on the other end of this year. Th those have been seemingly super instrumental in the profit margins of the sports betting operators here. Do you see that happening overseas as well, that there's a move toward different products that really appeal to the players in different ways? So I think what we see overseas is that in-play is really important mm -hmm. and really popular. But you're right that single game parlay products are enormously popular here in the US. Maybe it comes from the history around lottery, everyone you know, excited about putting in a small bet and this expectation that you can, you can win big. So that's been really popular here in the US. But we do have the same in Europe. We call it Maltese or, or Agus. Um, but I think the difference is that in play plays a larger role in Europe, but that's an opportunity for us here in the US. You're also, I know, really excited about live score. And, and I, I guess that gets a lot of eyeballs. A lot of eyeballs. So we acquired a company called Free 65 Scores, and they are a top free sports app globally. It's quite amazing, top free sports app. And they provide scores and analytics and updates to customers. They have almost 20 million. Um, active users a month, and each users go in three times a day to the app. That's quite significant. So what that means for us is that we can integrate it with our sports betting products. Uh, it gives us a better experience for the customer, but it also gives us a better access to customer, you know, longer lifetime value, the more we can engage them. I think that there's been so much focus on omni-channel um, and the potential for media content to drive mm. wagering action. And in some cases, it doesn't appear that it materialized. And I'm, I'm thinking about the high hopes that Penn Entertainment had for Barstool with how, you know, 66 million users of the Barstool media content that didn't necessarily translate into the same amount of betters for Penn, which was probably a good thing because some of those readers would have been underage. At any rate, how much faith do you have that you can convert the people who are on checking scores into players? We see some of the highest conversions from Scores app into real money gaming, and that's why we are so excited about it. But not only that, we've acquired a data company, so it enables us also to learn about our players' behavior, and that gives us a lot of opportunity to constantly engage them, feed them with exciting news, data scores, data analytics, and keep them engaged, because it's not 
throughout the day every time that they place a bet. But if we can keep them engaged, we can constantly make sure that they stay with us and they play with us. That also has the opportunity. I mean, you're getting so much data that when you are looking at somebody who may not have been a gambler ever, you could turn them into, okay, I'll try it, gambler. A, an occasional gambler. And then an occasional gambler into a frequent gambler. And a frequent gambler into a habitual gambler. I know that you're very concerned about problem gambling. One, give me the business case, not the moral case, but the business case for tackling addictive gambling head on. So let me just start by saying that most players play with us safely, securely. So it's a very small minority that run into problems with, uh, with playing with us or, or everyone else in the industry. But we need to take it seriously. And for us, we've been very clear that we want to be a responsible operator. And why is that? Well, fundamentally, we don't want to take money from anyone that cannot afford it. Um, we want to have players playing with us in a sustainable way, and that leads to higher quality of earnings going forward. So it's a couple of things, making sure that your players can afford to play with you, but also making sure that you only operate in regulated markets. There's a lot of operators that operate in markets that are not regulated and not paying taxes, but fundamentally that means that you don't have any security uh, around your earnings going forward. So we believe in being only in regulated, regulating markets, and making sure that we are a responsible operator and making sure that we protect our customers in the best way forward. Are, are you giving up any percentage of your profit margin because of that commitment to stay in regulated markets only? Yes, it has a short-term impact for sure, um, but that's a conscious decision we've taken. We estimate that over the last three years, the impact on EBITDA have been 500 million pounds. So we've guided to the market that we will deliver 1 billion um, pounds in EBITDA this year, so that's 50%. Okay, if you consider that investment, how do you get a return on that investment? Because your, basically your earnings going forward would be much higher quality, we have much better visibility, and your players stay with you longer, right? They can continue to play with you. You don't lose them because they hit the threshold. I know we don't have this in, in the U.S., but outside of the U.S., you have different spend limits uh, and deposit limits, so you want to make sure that you have a recreational base of your customers that can continue to play with you. In that way, how important are the free-to-play games, the for entertainment-only games? So we both develop and offer free-to-play games, and it's hugely popular in the UK. Um, so just to give you an example, we have on a weekly basis around 800,000 players that play with our free-to-play games in the UK, and almost 80% of those go on to place a bet um, with our real money gaming um, propositions. So that's quite high conversion, and it's, it's, you need to think about it in a way that we are a digital consumer company. So what matters for our business and one of the key drivers is to constantly engage our customers. So we're an entertainment business, right? So we need to constantly engage them, and when they're not placing a bet with us, it's great if they can play a um, free-to-play game. So that's a business model that is hugely successful for us. Yetta, you've made big in investments and commitments to research behind mm -hmm. problem gambling. One, do you think it's possible that we get so much data? I mean, if you think about it, um, addictive drinkers don't go and give away all their information so that someone can monitor their drinking or smoking or drug use or things like that. But with players, if there's an addiction issue, operators like you, you can see that. Do you think it's possible that we get data that help end other addiction problems, uh, you know, with, with drinking or, or, or drugs and things like that? I think we will learn a lot. Let, let me start by saying that we only use the data anonymously, right? So we make sure that it's anonymous data that we put into our models. But we work with Howard Medical School and other scientists, neuroscientists, psychologists, and they make assessment around problem gambling and behaviors that can lead into problem gambling. And then we test, we trial and test our AI models based on those data. So basically the technology we use becomes a virtual psychologist for you, and it's a personalized safety net that we pull out. But, but I think a lot of these addictions are combined. Um, so I think we can use that data to learn a lot about what really drives risk-based behavior. By the way, I just read an interesting note from an, a gaming analyst who, who said, <clears throat> we know that the rise in Ozempic 
may have some correlation to a disruption in addictive behaviors. And in some cases, problem gambling is estimated to account for 30% of business overall. So could Ozempic cause a problem for the profit margins of gambling companies? I thought it was a really interesting question to ask. Do you have an answer? <laughs> no. So I come from Denmark, and uh, Ozempic is produced by Novo Nordisk. So we're very happy with what they're doing. It's giving a boost to our GDP in Denmark. But outside that, I, I don't know. I think the most important thing here that that we we all need to be responsible operators, and we need to make sure as entertainment companies that it's our responsibility to make sure that players can play with us in a safe manner. Um, and whether these different addictions are combined or not, what we know from, from Europe is that majority of players play safely with us. It's 0.3% that are in risk, but that doesn't change the fact that we still have an obligation to do what we can to protect those small uh, number of players. Everyone in this audience is probably wondering why I haven't just launched into the question on everybody's mind, and that is... Why, if you believe in omni-channel so much, aren't you and MGM better together? Are you better together? You're operating bet MGM as separate entities, as like parents trying to raise this child, but parents with very different parenting philosophies. Bill Hornbuckle told me on CNBC this morning, it's a great marriage, his exact words. But wouldn't it be better if you were closer and... There are many ways to raise your children, I guess. Um, <laughs> and, and it is a great marriage. Um, and we work really well together. And I think the combination of intense technology and product and experience from online sports betting and iGaming across the world with MGM's brand, omnichannel experience, and their reward database, it's a really, really strong combination. Uh, and we work really well together. And we're fully focused on what we want to achieve. We're very competitive. Um, so we want to make BetMGM the best it can be. And there is nothing in the structure today that prohibits that, um, that makes BetMGM go slower. Um, so for us, it's all about you know, keeping our eye on the goal uh, and making sure we make BetMGM the best it can be. It, given the growth opportunities in the United States, I mean, how crucial is BetMGM for Intain? Would it be the kind of business line that you could consider selling off, selling out of your stake here? Or is that pivotal to your future growth? US is by far the biggest um, sports betting and gaming market in the world with a long runway for growth. So we are fully determined and dedicated to bet MGM here. Now, I get it, joint ventures don't last forever. Um, but for now, our focus is really on growing bet MGM. So it's not something that we need to solve for now but it's something that, that we can solve for at a later point. And, you know, Bill Hornbuckle went into the UK and launched BetMGM independent of Entain on their platform and their tech. Basically, competition in your own backyard, how do you see that symbolic move? We're used to competition every single day. Um, so the product that uh, MGM and Bill launched into the UK is not based on our technology, so... We are competing there, just as we're competing with everyone else. Uh, we're one of the biggest operators in the UK, so I don't see it changing the competitive dynamic there. Um, but yeah, there are competitors coming into the market every single day. Uh, how concerned are you about what happened with MGM and the cybersecurity and intrusion, and what, what impact has that had on that MGM? So we haven't seen an impact, so the Intain platform um, hasn't had any impact um, from, um, from the incidents that, that MGM has. But listen, we, we are a technology company. We have, on every single day on average, we have more trading events going through our platform than some of the biggest exchanges around the world. So as such, we have best, best practices around cybersecurity. Um, we believe in something called um, defense in debt. So that means that we layer um, our, our security and our protection uh, we have automated responses. We get um, threat intelligence, so we understand who is out there that might uh, want to try to get into our systems. So, so as a technology company, that is on our agenda every single day. Was there um, a seminar or an announcement? or an, Was there communication with your employees then and your vendors and your suppliers? Because 
they're, they're all part of this. Was there communication about the human possibility of failure? That, that, that it was a human being who allowed this yeah, to happen? social engineering. So this is not new for us, right? As a technology company, this is a challenge we face every single day. But we constantly, um, we constantly train and we constantly remind all our colleagues that they need to be careful because very often these threat actors get into your systems because of a human error or social engineering and they're getting smarter and smarter. So there's a number of things you can do outside just the technical protection and multi-factor uh, identification. That is training and training and training. Uh, as executives, we do dry runs every single year, mm -hmm. so we know what to do in that situation. And then I think you, you need to keep an eye on your suppliers because that's sometimes where there's an open door into your systems. I wanted to ask you a little bit about what's, what we're seeing happening in the Middle East. I know you have teams in Israel. Are you concerned about their welfare? I mean, are we, are we seeing a situation that's tenuous for your teams? So the situation in, in Israel is, is devastating, of course, uh, and it's evolving quite fast um, since we all woke up Saturday morning. Um, so we have teams on ground. So, so for my side, I'm, of course, concerned and, and make sure that we do everything we can to, to keep everyone safe. And if we need, we need to move them around and so forth. And finally, because I really want to get your take on the, the global trend for gaming. Where do you see the next big opportunity? You, we know that the attention and the focus really is the United States right now, but where else in the world are you excited about the opportunity? So there's a lot happening on, uh, on the regulatory side. Uh, and as a, an operator that only operates in regulated market, that's really what I have my eyes on. U.S. long runway for growth, so we're just four years into this, this journey. Um, one of the regions that we're excited about is LATAM. Uh, Brazil is in the process of regulating, uh, and we expect um, that we'll be licensed sometimes uh, in the first half of next year. It's a huge market. They love football, so the, the European kind of football, um, and we've been there for a long time and have strong relationships there and with 365 Scores, which is a top sports app also in, in Brazil. That's a market that, that we're excited about. Uh, in your established markets, are you still seeing organic growth or are you mostly seeing growth because of mergers and acquisitions? So we are seeing growth in practically all our markets. UK, and you've all heard about the white paper, is going through a period where there's a lot of new regulatory measures being put into place. But even through that period, we see underlying growth in the UK. So all markets are in growth. And, and when I look ahead across our portfolio, we expect that markets um, for the future will be growing mid to high single digits. And that's a mixed bag. Some regions continue to grow double digit. US for sure will go do grow double digit. Central Eastern Europe, Latin will grow double digit. But then you have some of the large and mature markets that will probably go mid to high single digit going forward. What keeps you up at night? Well, for me, it's always about making sure that um, our people are safe and the company uh, is in the right place. So these days, and of course, my thoughts go out to our teams in, in Israel. Um, but other than that, um, what keeps me up at night is to make sure we take um, advantage of all the growth opportunities ahead of us. Yet a Nygaard Anderson. It's the first time that we've been on stage together. Mm -hmm. I hope it won't be the last time. Neither. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. The man of the hour, MGM CEO, he's got a lot on his plate. F1 has gone in and taken out all the trees and built the grandstands and made all of his employees angry about how long it takes to get to work. There's a authorized strike going on. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot on Bill's plate. Bill Hornbuckle, CEO of MGM Resorts International, joins me now. Are you? Okay. Elite, you, you take this one so oh, that... Sure. It, that way, when I look at you, my hair doesn't cover my face and everybody can still... We have to <laughs> I was wondering this. why she was on that side. We have to do this strategically. <laughs> um, I led with the good news. <laughs> <laughs> Been, we've been busy. <laughs> um, we were walking over the expo floor, and I was asking you about the interconnectivity of this industry and how 
everyone in here is in some way, shape, or form facing the same kind of attack that you faced. Give us a sense of where you are as a company, whether that is fully in your rear view, and what your takeaway is that might be helpful to the people here. Sure. Look, it's, it's corporate terrorism at its finest. Um, you don't wish this on anybody. Uh, it happened to hit us. It was partially socially engineered, as I heard you talking to Yeta about. Um, and it was, you know, for the couple of weeks to our company, it was devastating. But I will say this. Um, we saw it early, so we had good indicators on the ground. By day two, we knew they were there. We reacted quickly to protect data. Um, and so you saw us shutting down systems by our, by our own design. Um, what ended up happening is you know, criminals literally understood what was happening, and they shut the balance of it down for us. And we found ourselves in an environment where for the next four or five days, with 36,000 hotel rooms and some regional properties, we were completely in the dark. I mean, literally the telephones, the casino system, the hotel system, the key system, and I could go on and on and on, were not functioning. And so, you know, you put the company to the test, and um, many of, well, I'm at the age where many of these systems were never automated to begin with, and so you suddenly find yourself, well, this is what you need to do at the front desk, and this is what you need to do here. And it was an interesting cultural moment for the company to come together. I think you saw we rebounded quickly, um, we, were, we are now three weeks into this thing, come, uh, come over this past weekend, uh, and it is behind us with, with the assumption that what is behind us is that the current threat is gone, but there is always a threat. Um, and so these threat actors and other threat actors continue, I heard your earlier comment a moment ago to Yetta, they continue, they're always there. And, and so you've got to be vigilant about it. What we do going forward in terms of architecting the system, how we think about social engineering, how we think about processes, obviously needs to get better and will be better. Um, but we're proud of what we did. Um, we did not pay ransom. Not that that's the defining moment in one of these things. I, I know, you, you know people say don't pay ransom. Um, but the way this came at us and the velocity at which it came at us, we reacted quickly, we protect data, and we find ourselves now a couple weeks into this thing fully functioning. We have all our commercial systems back. And you saw our 8K. This is probably going to cost us in the range of 100 million. It is covered by cyber insurance, thankfully. I can only imagine what next year's bill will be. <laughs> but, but it is covered by cyber insurance. And so um, you know, moving forward, it's about reinvestment into infrastructure, people, and process. Not just your insurance bill, but yeah, everybody's we'll, cyber insurance well, bill. It, it's not just our company. You've all seen. I mean, we, we had a headline yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, Clorox and MGM. I mean, talk about two diverse businesses. Mm -hmm. But their ability to strangle a business is pretty meaningful. Can you talk to me a little bit about what went into your decision not to pay the ransom? Was that a moral decision for you? Look, at a certain point, again, because it happened so quickly, we were already in defense mode. We were playing for the first day, whack-a-mole, don't let them hear, don't let them hear, let's do this, let's do that. And then it became a tactical decision, almost. Um, by day three, it was, it will take us as long, because they never got into the core systems, they got into the DNS layer, they got into the communication layer. And so it took us, um, it, it took us as long to figure out how to get out of it as we thought they would tell, tell us what to do to get out of it. And so this was a decision of, no, we shouldn't be paying a ransom. It's gonna take us as long to figure this out anyways, even if they gave us the encryption keys. And so let's just move forward and put ourselves, when we get through this, in a much different and better place. And, and then what's your takeaway? Like if you, if you had it to do differently, what would you have done differently? Look, part of the social engineering piece is there are two, we have two call centers. We have a call center that's for my machine is broken, and then we have a tech call center, which is for the technical crew. That's the layer that got engineered, if you will. Yeah. And so how that process works going forward needs to be rethought and, re, you know, and just period redone has been and will continue to be. <clears throat> um, that's the key lesson. And then to the extent you can all bifurcate systems, and that's hard to do at scale, but it, particularly when you want to have a common voice of a customer in a single data warehouse. At the end of the day, you're trying to understand a customer and its total worth. So all that leads to a central place all by design. But the way that you structure your environment in terms of pillars and keeping them, if they get into one, they don't get into all is critical architecture. And so that's probably the second largest takeaway. Is that complicated at a time when we're looking at 
I mean, every is out here sponsoring the session, um, the common wallets and cashless payments and, and, the, and your portable player rewards that go everywhere. Is it hard to keep things siloed if the industry is trying to move toward more co cohesion? It, look, it makes it, it makes it more complicated. But in our example, one of the things we were able to protect was banking information, credit card information. Nothing got out. Um, and so even despite the scale of the hack that we had, that kind of information didn't get out. It's just like doing banking. And so, yeah, I think everyone needs to be vigilant and diligent about what to do. But no, I don't think it gets in the way of what we're trying to all accomplish with you know, uh, e-wallet, et cetera. Okay, headwind number one. <clears throat> headwind number two is the ongoing negotiations about the contract here. This may not, I mean, maybe the vendors aren't concerned, but I am because I want to make sure that when I come for F1, <laughs> the whole city's not on strike. So what are, you doing? what, do you what are you doing about it? <laughs> Look, um, I'd start at 40,000 feet. We've had a relationship with the culinary in this town for the entire time our company's existed. Um, the last major strike that hit Las Vegas was 1984, so it's been 39 years since it's been a citywide strike of any So we're overdue. Of any scale. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we're not overdue. Um, Good response, though. I'll give you that. <laughs> no, we're not. But, but look, things have changed. Um, obviously, there's a great deal of pressure. If you look at what's happened to our workforce here, and, and it's kind of interesting. It's divergent. There are those that are tipped and then non-tipped. And what's happening, if you're a tipped employee in today's environment in Las Vegas, particularly with the rise in pricing and whatnot, you're doing better than you've ever done, full scale, full stop. If you're a non-tipped employee and you think about COVID and you think about some of the work rules have been put in play and what the consumer now wants. 40% of the consumers don't want their room cleaned, which means if you're a guest room attendant, you're getting nothing but checkouts to do. And so there's added pressure on that. And so we understand that, we need to adapt to that. Um, myself and the other CEOs in town are engaged at the highest level with the union. Um, I'd like to think and hope to believe that we will get to a satisfactory place through over the next the coming weeks. Um, you will see an informational picket starting tomorrow, I think up and down the strip. I suspect they'll do that during this process, but I think what's important is to end up in a rational place for both them and us, because it's gotta be about the long term. We can't do something that's irrational, um, and we won't, uh, and so we're thinking about it longer term, and we'll see where we end up here. Does the Hollywood writer strike and actor strike, UAW on strike right now, Sean Fain has had some really incredible messaging and posturing there. Do, do you think that that has had any influence on what you're seeing locally? No, I, it, look, it, it doesn't help when UAE and Detroit's asking for 40%. I mean, that's a top line that's hard to ignore. Um, that being said, I think what matters here locally is people's ability, particularly on the front line, to exist, to pay rent, and to get you know, to the next step in life. Um, and so I think that's what's relevant. I think every place is a little bit different. Go back to the example I gave. The, the food server who works in a steakhouse is making more money than they've ever made by far. The guest room attendant has got more work than they've ever had by far. And so it's just a, you know, it's a give and a, a take, if you will. How excited are you about F1? Very. Um, it will be the single largest event Las Vegas has ever seen. Um, our ADRs, particularly in our premium properties, are up about 400%. Um, we have looked at uh, front money and credit, which is the measure we have going into any event, <clears throat> and it is 2x the biggest fight we've ever had. Pacquiao Mayweather, a couple years back, was the biggest event we ever had. Going into it with four weeks to go or five weeks to go, it's the biggest event we've ever seen. But when you have a fight, you don't have to cut down your trees. Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to cut down your trees. We have additional trees that will go in pots that we are going to bring back. I promise you. I promise everybody. I have gotten so beat up on this on social media. <laughs> we have trees coming back. <laughs> the tree, I'm a tree hugger okay, myself. Apparently, apparently. Welcome to Las Vegas. <laughs> I, also, no, we, I also like I, small children and yeah, old people. I, look, I think, the, <laughs> I think the excitement this will bring and you know, it kind of it, understand where this town has evolved to. I if think about even this week. I, I was just saying to somebody last night. I went to the Green Bay Packers play the Raiders. Tonight I'm going to watch the Golden. Who were you rooting for? Uh, who was I rooting for? The yeah. Raiders. 
although we did take a hit <laughs> in, the, in the sports book. But um, tonight I'm going to go uh, for the Golden Knights. They're going to get the Stanley Cup award, and they're going to hang the banner. Tomorrow night we have the World Championship WNBA Game 2 of the finals. Um, we have Formula One. We have Super Bowl. What this town has been able to do in the last four or five years in terms of transformation into next, now the next genre of activity case with sports has been pretty incredible. And so we're very excited by it. But I th I, F1 will be the pinnacle of it year in and year out. I'm convinced of that. I, I know that there's been a lot of hassle about how the workforce gets here. Do you anticipate one, what, what happens for the actual race, but how does that resolve next year and the year after that? Well, okay, there'll be a lot to learn. Um, you know, this year was exceptionally disruptive because the infrastructure had to go in play. Now each year it'll get easier and easier. Um, we have yet to go through that operational exposure and experience of getting our employees into the properties. Frankly, we're better positioned than most because we sit outside the loop of the track. Mm -hmm. And so with the exception of Bellagio on the front of Cosmopolitan, all our employees will come in the same way they always do, which is the back of the building. They'll park in their normal spots. I think the properties, this one is an example, surrounded in the middle. You'll see shuttles, you'll see exterior parking facility, facilities put up. You'll see um, a great deal of effort put in transporting employees back and forth. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the potential for mergers and acquisitions. One, are the capital markets back in a place where we're going to start to see more movement, more deals being done? It's, they're in a much better place than they were if you go back six, nine months ago. Um, you know, it's still expensive money in some cases. It just depends on what the prize is. And Tain would be a pretty big prize, right? We love our partnership the way it exists today. <laughs> you, did say, you did say in earnings earlier this year that you were putting that to bed, that you know, we're moving on, and then you went and launched BetMGM in the UK. You heard me ask Yetta about that. Where, where do you see this going? I mean, how, for how long can two very different companies in this space continue to co-operate a platform like BetMGM? Look, but they're very different, which makes for a great partnership. They're the tech, they're the know-how. We're the, the brick and mortar, we're the database, we're the marketing, we're the brand. You put it together and it's made a pretty powerful combination. Um, we have some work to do. It's not lost on us that FanDuel and DraftKings have a lead. Don't like that, don't like that at all. Um, we've got single account, single wallet coming. We're gonna have Intain in Nevada, which simply means I can leave here with money in a wallet and take it home to Colorado and ultimately use it. So we've got some work to do. But if you step back and you said four years, from, four years ago, you'd be the number three, you'd be the number one iGaming supplier in the country, um, would you be happy with that and your partnership? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, we have global aspirations that extend beyond just what's happening here with BetMGM. We think for now it is absolutely the best fit for all of us. You heard it from Yeti, you're hearing it from me. Um, uh, Bet MGM, it's our brand, it's our name. So to put it in UK was a test of the brand, a test of the name, to see, see frankly, some of our operating prowess through our Leo Vegas enterprise. Um, and I like what's happened in the first three or four weeks, but it's very early days there. And so, you know, we like what we have and the way it's structured today. But does it matter market share? If you're the third run operator, does it matter market share? And if we look at New York, which breaks out results by week, it now appears that Caesars is the number three operator with that nine, ten percent of market share. Is um, that concerning to you? Look, look, it's always concerning when you're not number one. I mean, that, that's an aspiration for everyone. In a place like New York, not as when the tax is fifty-one percent and they tax promotional allowances on top of it. I, we are frankly, it's our brand that's carrying us there. We are what we are. We spend very little marketing dollars in a traditional sense there because of that. And. Frankly, any other state that thinks that's a winning long-term formula will do the same thing. Uh, just, it's not an environment that's ripe for long-term success. On the bricks and mortar side in New York, there's still a lot of sharp elbows out trying to win one of these three downstate casino licenses that are up for grabs. Do you have any sense of what your chances are now? And, and, and also, I mean, the chatter in New York has been, does the cyber attack hurt your chances? Um, well, one-time event, I don't think so. And, and frankly, I think if you look at what the company was able to do, the resiliency, our ability to react to things like that, I think proves something all, onto its surface all by itself. Um, I think if you look about the competition that's in New York, um, we literally submitted our second round of questions this week. So now it's back up to the Gaming Commission to then push forward, and that it's up to their timing and their clock. 
We would hope by year end, we hear something on starting the actual RFA process. Um, we are ready to go. Um, what we have in our favor is we have Yonkers support and community support, which is the deal there. Yeah. In New York, you need to have local support from the community, and we have it. Um, they like what we're doing. They're excited by what we're doing. Um, and, and currently, we're a taxpayer to the state of over $360-odd million a year. I like the fact that we are. <laughs> and so we'll see how this plays out. There are no guarantees. Uh, we're not cocky or arrogant about it. We've got work to do and, and the position to prove there. But I think we're in a great shape. How are things looking in Macau? Uh, amazing. Um, uh, we just came through Golden Week. Uh, All-time record five-day period in the history of our company. Um, and so uh, it's continued to rebound. Las Vegas rebounded quickly. Macau rebounded like overnight. And we've continued to hold share. We're at about 16% for this month, uh, which for us, given the scale, given the 9% we started from pre-pandemic, we're excited by, uh, very excited by actually. And um, in that market continues to do amazing things. Your competitor across the street, Wynn Resorts, is very eager about the new collaboration in the United Arab Emirates. Do you look at the Middle East, and, and I understand that the world perspective may be changing as we sit up here and speak, but do you see that as an area of more opportunity? Yes. Um, we were there early. Uh, we started a relationship, well, obviously it was a relationship with City Center and Dubai World, which got us familiar with the region and got us comfortable. We ended up in a relationship with a group called Wassel, uh, it's a holding company of the rulers who has hotels and other assets. And we've had a project that is now underway uh, that we began to work on back in 2015. It is on Plateau Island. It's at the base of Jumeirah Beach and the base of um, uh, Burj Al Arab. They look at each other. Uh, this 25-acre island has an MGM, a Bellagio, and an Ari on it. Um, and we are now building a podium and a pedestal that could house a casino. Um, we think there will be three or four in the Emirates. It's up to each ruler to decide what they want to do and where they want to do it. Um, we're positive. I'd love to be in Dubai with an operating company that has a casino in it, but one step and one day at a time. But um, irrespective of what's happened in the past couple of days, which is extremely tragic, we're very progressive and excited by what could happen there. Part of what we're seeing as an impact already is the domestic airlines stopping service internationally to and from Israel. Um, there have already been questions on our air about whether this moves us a little more toward recession. Give me a sense of your high level view of the American consumer and what we're bracing for for this last quarter of the year. Well, I, I, look, as it relates to a war, never good for an economy, although people, some would argue that it is, but obviously particularly in this environment, not good for the economy. Um, the actual visitation back and forth as a total percentage of what happens uh, holistically in the United States is single digit and smaller. Um, you look at this market, heavy Canada, heavy Mexico, heavy Western Europe, um, and heavy Asia. Um, so I, I think it's limited in that context. It is one more thing uh, for people to be concerned by as they should be. And so you know, I think we all have to pay attention to it. We think about what's happening here though uh, the fourth quarter still looks brighter than it's ever looked. Um, and the notion of recession, when we look at advance, even, even coming out of what we just came out of, last week was our biggest booking week in a very long time, thinking about the next four months. Uh, so it's been, you know, how much money people ultimately bring in terms of rev poor, revenue per occupied room, versus coming and showing up, time to tell. But the great news is people are still coming and showing up. And their, their appetite for this environment, frankly, has never been stronger. Bill, it's great to see you. Thank you Pleasure. very Thank much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you all. And by the way, back tomorrow.